Long time no see, Wendy. Hey, Joe, did you let Brian in? I did. I'm I'm letting everybody <laughs> in. Yes. Hi, Joe. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Barbara? I'm good. Trying to stay on top of the uh, waiting room. Hey, Brian. Brian, congratulations. I forgot to say that in the other meeting. Can you show us a picture of the baby? My baby? No, not you alone. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can do it easily. Let's see. You see that? See that's my little guy and my big guy now. Nice. Aww. Yeah. My wife's a saint today because I've been down here getting ready for this. I was day. just going to ask how she was doing. She's good. Baby's up a pound since uh, you got out of the hospital and we're good. Are you sleeping yet? I'm sleeping, selfishly. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the baby uh, slept for over six hours last night and over five the night before. So that's that's been good too. Yes. All right, we're gonna get we're gonna get started right at two, so we're just letting people in. Yep. Um, and Brian, you're up first, correct? Yep. Okay, so we're gonna I'm gonna make you host right now. So just keep an eye on the waiting room. Um, okay. You can just keep letting people in. Yeah. Are they all gonna populate on the bottom. Uh, oh, I see. I see. Yeah, participants. Yep. I'm recording for those of you, just so everybody knows. Um, I'm recording the meetings. Um, Okay, it's two o'clock, so we're going to get started. Uh, we want to be, be punctual. Um, just as a reminder, presenters just try to you know, keep a, you know, keep a running log of where you start. We're trying to keep everything to 20 minutes. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining today. So Brian Finnegan's going to start us off. Uh, the purpose of today is for our, our um, people that are doing the presenting to get uh, feedback from all of you. Um, they are in the process of completing their case study to be certified Google trainers, and we appreciate them um, taking the time to do so. So, um, Brian, it's all you, man. Take it away. All right. Thank you, sir. All righty. Just gonna take my screen out. Fire this up. Uh, Joe, I just, I don't know if I'll be able to admit people from this screen. Um, um if you look at the, t if you should see like a little, what kind yeah. of device do you want? If you don't mind me asking. Okay. okay. So the other thing, if you want to, make me a host at the same time i can keep track of the waiting room if you need i don't think you i don't think you can doesn't allow me to yep oh, doesn't allow me to do more than one but if you look there should be a bar where you can kind of click yeah on i it. got i'm i'm getting them i can get them still no problem that's They're the only coming. that's the only wonky part as we go through this so right um, all right so bear with me everybody while i uh i uh let people in as i'm doing this too all right um okay uh 
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to do the uh, the Google Forms for us all today. I kind of pivoted when I was when I was setting this up. I said I was going to try and take on everything Google Forms, and then I realized I was doing this from a distance, and I only had 20 minutes. And I said, why don't we just focus a little bit here? And so we're going to focus on designing the forms, but then securing the forms. If you're ever going to make uh, an exam for your class. Uh, it's important that you're able to secure them so that you can keep using them and then you can feel good about the validity of your test and all that. So, uh, so off we go. So, uh, all right, here we go. So uh, my name is Brian Finnegan, uh, nine years here at uh, Woodbridge Township. Uh, I work at, uh, as a bio teacher at Colonia High School. Uh, I got certified as a Google educator uh, this past year, levels one and two. And uh, I was a tennis coach, and now we're on the sidelines for the spring. So, uh, so I kind of put myself into this, uh, really kind of pushing through here. So, uh, and I, uh, I have to change this. It does say I'm a father of two boys. One is on the way. That one uh, came, came two weeks ago. So I'm a father again uh, as of two weeks ago. So that's enough about me here. Let me add some more people to the, to the room, and off we go. So, all right, friends. So. When you're designing an exam for using forms, I always like to start off in my web browser. You just type in form.new and, uh, and you hit enter and a new Google form will pop on up. Uh, and you're gonna make a, a title for that exam, whatever you wanna call it. I always have it with my chapter first, uh, chapter 11 genetics, if you will. And then, uh, and then I'm gonna head right over to that gear, that settings gear right there. And, uh, and then I'm gonna set this thing up so that it's, uh, so that it's capable of, of uh, making it a test for me. So uh, once you're in settings, you're gonna notice that window pops up and there's gonna be three tabs, uh, general, presentation, and quizzes. Uh, for general, you just wanna make sure that you're collecting email addresses and that you're using, uh, you're using our domain, our Woodbridge Township School uh, District domain. And since it's a test, you wanna make sure that you're limiting to uh, one response. Um, and then once you do that, you can tab over to presentation. Sorry, friends, I gotta click in and out of Zoom here. Um, when you're in uh, presentation mode or uh, the presentation tab, uh, those are all options. They're not necessary, uh, but they might, they might be in some nice uh, uh, features that you can add to your, uh, to your exam. For instance, some of my exams tend to be a little bit longer, so it's nice to have a progress bo uh, bar that you're providing to your uh, students. And then whenever they hit submit, sometimes they're unsure they submitted, so it's nice to give them a confirmation me message. I tell them to relax, You're, you, you completed the exam, it's been received, and then maybe I'll have like uh, instructions on the whiteboard behind me, something that they can do once they're done. Oftentimes I tell them to close their Chromebooks uh, and uh, do something without them. Uh, okay, and then the most important tab is the quizzes tab. You're gonna wanna click to make this a quiz, and then you're gonna wanna click the turn on the locked mode, uh, that's my favorite feature. I begged uh, the, the school district to uh, let me have it when it was in beta, uh, but uh, I only got it at the, end of, uh, at the end of the last year, and I've been loving using it all this school year. Um, and then the other thing I wanna make sure you do is you wanna make sure you are uh, choosing the later when you, uh, when you can release the grades. I'd choose the later after manual review. That gives you control on when your answers are given to them. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay, so once you've uh, set up all your settings, you got your title, it's time to get building your exam. Um, I kind of assume that most of this is intuitive to a lot of you all. Um, there are many options on how you can uh, choose what kind of questions and how you want to question your kids in your exams. Short answers are great, paragraphs, but uh, if you want it to be graded as, uh, as quickly as possible, as, as automatically as possible, you would stick with the multiple choice, uh, the check boxes. Uh, I often make quick little vocabulary quizzes using the drop down boxes, um, uh, where I, every vocab term that I have, I kind of build a, uh, a drop box choice for, and then I give the definitions. That's a nice little uh, feature there. For my math uh, teachers, um, I've seen this a little bit recently with the file upload feature. You might want to have, you might want to use a Google form, but there's a lot of uh, work uh, that, that's associated with that. Uh, a lot of like, you know, working out the issues and they can't write out the problems or they show their work, so to speak. So what you could do is you could have them work out their work on a piece of paper and then they can snap photos of that and upload that to, uh, to the form. So you have the answers that's checked. And then if things seem a little wonky, you can go in and look at what they've done, look what they've worked out uh, 
on the um, just admitting more people on the uh, on on the pictures that they send to you. So um, so I think that most of you are able to uh, build the exam. Uh, and so now I'm going to move in my 20 minutes here to the to the uh, the securing of your exam. And uh, my advice to you is that you should want to do this. Um, or it's unlikely that you're going to be able to use the same exam for the next semester, the next school year, or even maybe the next block. Uh, so um, when I'm securing my exam, I want to uh, take advantage of all the features that Google has to offer for us. And that's the features in Google Forms and then also uh, in conjunction with uh, Google Classroom. So uh, you want only your students to view your exam and only when you want them to. And if you consider these six options, uh, you'll be able to do that. Uh, you'll have ultimate control, so to speak. Uh, so uh, the first one is that you should administer all form exams through Google Classroom, um, for sure. Um, in, my, in my school, we have to have Google Classrooms anyway. Uh, so it makes sense to have your forms uh, administered throughout, through them. Uh, as we mentioned before, you wanna put all of your forms in locked mode. Um, you want to toggle the accepting responses switch on and off. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. Uh, number four, you're going to want to release the grades manually. Um, you're going to want to make a copy of your form for each unique class that you give the test to, if you intend on giving the same test throughout multiple blocks of your day or on different days. You want to give a different version or a different copy of that form to each class. And then this is the extra, this is kind of high level stuff. And I gotta be honest with you, I don't exactly uh, use this yet. Um, you can also create a response validation password so you can control um, who has access. You're really controlling that link, uh, so to speak, if, uh, if you have that going. So let's get into some of this. So, all right, so uh, number one, using Google Classroom. Uh, I, what's nice is that uh, distance learning has really made us all much better at using the, uh, using the Google Classroom. Uh, I would make a post just for your exam, uh, set, set the uh, due date on it, uh, whatever topic you're using. Uh, but the most important thing is, is that you add through your Google Drive or where, wherever you've built that form, you add that form there. And right there, it already gives you the option to add it to lock mode if it isn't already. Um, uh, but this is going to allow you to do grade importing. This is gonna allow you to grade the forms when they're submitted, uh, that only your class is gonna have access to that link, which is nice. And then you're gonna be able to give them their feedback through the classroom as well. Um, uh, it's not, it, it removes the need for having emails and notifications and all that. It's all just in our classroom and it keeps it secure. Uh, number two, uh, you should, uh, place all exam forms in locked mode. Uh, this is what it looks like on the top of your quiz when uh, it's in locked mode. Locked mode is great because what it does is it closes out all tabs. It creates like kind of a full screen mode for your form so that the only thing that the, the student is able to access is the quiz itself. Uh, and as soon as they hit submit on that quiz, the, uh, the quiz, um, um, all the other tabs, tabs that they had before they were uh, taking the quiz come back. They don't lose anything, um, but they have, uh, they have a, a, a focused one tab situation. They can't Google answers on the side anymore. Um, the other nice thing about uh, locked mode is that if they do try to circumvent that, if they leave the test and then they join back in, even if you're not able to say observe them on GoGuardian or something, uh, when the submission comes through, there's a little exclamation point that lets you know hey, they left lock mode and they jumped back in. So, so even, even when you're not paying attention, Google's looking out for you with lock mode. Uh, all right, so number three, uh, toggling the accepting responses um, off and on. You have two tabs when you're building any Google form. It always starts with your questions when you're building your questions, and then you can toggle over to responses. And right in the top right part of the, the responses page is this little switch, and it's the switch I press the most on test day. Um, I would always keep it in not accepting responses. I always like to give them this silly little message because uh, they might be able to see the form link in Google Classroom, they click on it. It's not test time yet, I'll say no peeking, no peeking on my test. So um, instead of maybe in the past, you had a whole bunch of paper materials that you would be passing out. My kids know, they all have their Chromebooks open. 
And when I hit that switch, they know the test has begun and they have however much time I've, I've given them. And when you close that response, you've closed that response. They can still work on their test, but you won't be able to receive their response anymore. Um, and so it gives you the control on when they're able to open the link and then when they're able to give it to you. Um, so that's number three. Uh, really, it should probably be number one, but it's number three. Uh, number four, uh, releasing grades manually. This prevents feedback from being uh, out in the wild, so to speak. So um, the uh, default option means that you're gonna release the grade immediately after a submission. Uh, so when they hit submit, they'll immediately get that feedback. And you might not want that because a student might have finished very early. Now they're getting the answers to the form while their buddies next to them are still working on the test. So it's best if you hold on to that. So you hold, you hold on to that by selecting the later after manual review. And um, you, can, you can grade the short answers. You can grade the, the long form questions. You can see if you want to omit something, if you want to curve it. And then you have the, the power to, to send them all back when you're ready to do so. So that's a way you can secure exams as well. Uh, number five, um, in the drive, um, making copies of your exams. So if I were to hop out of here real quick, I'll show you my drive. Let me get a presentation mode, here we go. Here's my drive right here. And uh, in my drive, I literally have a folder of just all my original forms. Um, so a folder for just my major assessments. And so these are like kind of my, uh, my main files. I don't actually touch them anymore once I make them. And I have two versions of all the exams because I have uh, uh, in-class resource classes where I've modified versions as well. Uh, but any one of those tests, if I want to make a test for the class, I go into my, my masters, I just make a copy. And now I don't have to worry about I have a copy that's just for that class. So if I make a copy of this, it'll pop up in a second. It'll say copy of, and I'll actually end up rewriting the name. I'll rename it. Uh, you know, uh, this is my test for, uh, for my block one uh, of 2020, you know, blah, 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 something like that. Just, the, just so you know, now I have that form that's just for that one block. I'm only gonna give that link to that classroom. Uh, and it gives you uh, a sense of uh, control on who's able to see it and when you and when and when they're able to see it. And my last uh, my last piece of business, like I said, is the uh, is the uh, is the extra security that I was talking about, a response validation. Now, um, when you're building questions, this would want this would be the first question you would build. It's a uh, it's a short answer question. And once you select it's a short answer, you can click this, uh, the three little jelly beans on the bottom right. And you can select that it's gonna be a response validation. And you'll get these, this little option right here about what kind of validation you're looking for. And so it, as default, it always gives you a number, but then you have to toggle that you want it to be equal to. And by doing that, you've essentially created a password. Um, my password very simple this time, I made it one, two, three, four. And then you can actually write a little response if they get the password wrong. All right, so it's a question where it's simply, they just have to write the, the number or the password that you give them, whether you write it on your whiteboard or you just uh, announce it out loud. All right, so you got that, right? Great, so that's part one. Part two is that now you have to then, whoops, oh, I, went, I jumped the gun here. Now I'm celebrating and I don't even wanna celebrate. Um, part two is now you need to create sections for your form. So. Uh, clicking that little that little guy in your little toolbar, this is our little section icon, it creates a partition in your questions. And so if you have your enter the password section, you can then uh, say if you get this correct, you can tell them to move on to the next section. And so the only way that they can move on to the actual exam is if they, um, is if they enter the password correctly. And so it's a little drop down bar underneath the question that allows you to redirect them if you get if you get it right, you can move on. So, what I encourage all of you to do is, if you think you've done this right, you've, if you think you've built this correctly, um, I would go right into preview mode. So, actually, in order to preview your own quizzes, believe it or not, you have to take them out of locked mode. That's a little tip for you. But once you've built your exam, I would preview it and make sure that you've done things correctly. So, for instance, I did a uh, a little. Uh, 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 response validation for this for this test that I did for the uh, the date today. So I did 
May 12th of 20. And if I did this correctly, I'm now in the test. And so unless I gave them that password, they wouldn't be able to get in this test. Now I'll be able to take the multiple choice. And here's a, another view of, uh, of section, right? So here's one section and I move on to the next one and I move on to the next one. So, so that's a preview of it. Um, and then again, I was accepting responses at the time. So now I don't want to accept uh, responses anymore. And now I can take a look at how all my students did. And so now you're in the grading and the reviewing process. So uh, out of 11, my, my students didn't do so hot today, but that's okay. Uh, I actually, actually didn't teach them anything either. So that's probably part of the problem. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so there you go. Uh, I haven't, it's weird. I'm talking to a very quiet space in my, in my basement. So I'm not hearing anybody here, but, uh, maybe I can uh, stop sharing here and see if uh, someone has a question for me. Let's see. If I, are there any questions? Let's see. Any hands raised there? Big room. The biggest room I've ever been in, in charge of. No. Brian, there was one question. Somebody, mm -hmm. you mentioned GoGuardian earlier. I guess that might be something that we just used up at the high school level. I don't know if they use that down in the lower grades. Right, yet. right, right. Yeah. So GoGuardian is a, is a piece of software that uh, Colonia has uh, that allows us to uh, view all the, uh, all the Chromebook screens in our, uh, in our classroom. And so it's a, it's a force of habit to just open up the GoGuardian and make sure that it's a tab that they know. Um, that we're watching in and even if we don't look at that screen uh it creates a timeline of all the tabs they opened and what they were doing you get emails for what they were off task so there's a lot of good watchdogging and uh very little that you actually have to be staring at your screen the entire time for so uh but locked mode does a nice job of of helping you out if if go garden is not an option that you uh that you have uh, let's see in the chat here um, do you just set up a specific time that they can take the test? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, in my Google classroom, when you make a post, you can create a, a due date for them. Right. And so my due dates for my tests are when the tests are going to start. Uh, and then I'll go in the drive and on my Chromebook, I'll have my form open there. And then really I just decide when the test is going to start is when I'm going to just toggle over that accepting responses switch. So I flip that switch and then they can click the link that's always been in front of them. They have access to it. And so it's really whatever, you don't have to uh, set a time when it pops up. If you'd like, what you can do is you can schedule the post. I'm sure you guys have scheduled posts before in Google Classroom. So if you schedule the post and then just keep the, the accepting response open, it can pop open for a certain, certain time. So there are certain ways you can, you can play around with that if you're someone who likes to schedule. Uh, those things, uh, but you can't schedule it for it to close. So once you open the open the box, you have to be there to close it. You're welcome. Thank you, friends. I got one more minute of my time. Uh, thank you for loving the purple. I think it looks great too. Uh, I was trying to stick with the Google form theme. Everything's purple in there. Um, I'll just pop my uh, last slide on there where I say thanks via my Bitmoji. I'm proud of that color too. Uh, and uh, I encourage you all to uh, to take my uh, oh I'm not sharing so you didn't get to see it that's embarrassing. Um, I encourage you all of you to take uh, my survey or give me a lot of feedback. This is my first one that I've done, so give me the feedback. Uh, be honest, and uh, and I'll be better next time. So we we shared that um, a a document earlier today. I'm going to try and throw it into the chat in just a minute. It's going to have the links to every. Oh yeah. I, so I think I have that link too. Actually, Brian, that's awesome. So Brian, if you have that, you could just throw that in the chat. So as you see each presentation, you could just pop in at the end and fill out the survey. That, that for, for the people that did these trainings today, that is the most important thing uh, for them. They need to have feedback to reflect on their teaching um, for when they apply. So very nice job, Brian. Thanks for getting us off to a great start. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. Even with, a, even with the sleepiness of having a new baby at home. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of, uh, lots of bonding time. I'm happy to have that. Though. That's for Good. Sure. Great way to look at it.
Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll get we'll get those surveys in the in the chat feature for you in just a second. I'll look for that, and we will move on to so um, Brian. If you want to transfer over host to the next person, that would be great. Yep. Uh, looking for you. Wendy's going to be on the bottom, right? W for Wendy. Yeah, most likely. Yep. All right. There you go, Wendy. All right. Fantastic. All right, um, first thing I'm gonna do for everybody, I'm gonna actually throw a link to a copy of my presentation in the chat if anybody wants to pull it and follow along in case anything doesn't happen to work out right out the gate. Um, all right. Share my screen here. All right. All right, hopefully everybody else isn't getting the little bit of feedback that is coming through on my end. Hopefully that clears up. All right, so my name is Wendy Jaworski and today uh, we're gonna be walking through the idea of using Google Sites as a summative assessment, um, a long-term project that you can hopefully push out to your kids um, and use to try to hone some of those 21st century skills that kids are now finding out that they need to um they need to oh hold on a second let me get everybody muted here okay perfect sorry about that all right so again as i said we're going to use google sites to create a summative evaluation this first portion um talks about the idea that just a quote that I came across, that teachers are becoming learning facilitators. Their role is shifting from instructing to helping them construct their own learning. One of the things as we've been moving towards this one-to-one -one system that um, I'm finding is that we really need to move away from the idea of the Chromebook being something that we just word process and research on and that we're um, imploring these kids to really kind of move forward and show us how you learn, what you learn, what's important to you. Okay, so a little bit about me. My name again is Wendy Jaworski. I've been teaching for 18 years. Um, and I teach high school science over at Colonia High School. This year I got my Google One and Google Two certification and I'm in the process of trying to secure my Google training certification. Um, this year in particular, I've kind of taken the time to embrace the idea that I'm a self-proclaimed computer nerd. Um, and hold on one second. Okay. Um, and tend to do a lot of boating, not getting that done this year. And I am a wife and mom to two little kids who have certainly taught me a lot about teaching high school and teaching elementary school at the same time. All right, so in this training, the first thing I want to do is just introduce you to what Google Sites is, as well as how to use Google Sites as a summative assessment, how to manage that assessment in Google Classroom, and then finally, if we have any questions, I can get those out, hopefully answer those for people at the end. All right, so Google Sites itself is part of the G Suite system, and what it is is it's a website creator that really anyone can work with. A lot of it is drag and drop. Some of it is um, a little more intensive than that, but it not only allows for the kids to create as individuals, but you can certainly set up situations where the kids would collaborate on a site. The assignment that I use it for in my class, we, um, they each create their own individual site because it um, gives them a voice and gives them a chance to kind of put their work together. All right, this is a, um, is a situation in which they got to pick materials throughout the school year and they were, um, they were able to showcase items in each chapter that were important to them. Okay, so the way that this portfolio assessment worked is that it was a collection of work and it allows the kids to choose either items that they really enjoyed, items that they couldn't stand, something that spoke to them that they were going to be able to 
take a moment and reflect on. And the major things that they were reflecting on were the idea of what the actual item was, what they learned from it, and then why they chose it, which is where that positive and negative um, potential for reflection comes in. And I like this assignment in particular because it really is summative. It's long term. We started at the end of the first chapter or section, whatever it is that we're doing, and we carry it all the way through to the end of the school year. And we use each of those moments in time, the end of that section, the end of that um, chapter as a checkpoint or a moment to make sure that the project is building so that they're not at the end trying to make up all these pieces that aren't as fresh in their brain. All right, so the way in which you do that, you're either going to go to sites.google.com, which you can type into the menu, you can type into the taskbar at the top, or you can go over to the little waffle and pull it down, and sites is in that first set of nine icons. It's then gonna open a page similar to the one that you see here, which one of the first things that you should make sure that you encourage your kids to do so that the work doesn't get lost in translation is name the site. Give it some type of name so that they can keep track of it. I don't know how often we all go to look for work and we get 9 million untitled papers that we then have to go back and figure out who the author was. So first things first, have them name that site. All right, so then the next thing that I wanna talk about or I wanted to point you guys out to is the page layout. And in there, you can create a basic layout um, of the portfolio as a class, you could have them create the title page and then create a sub page under each section, which you see over on the side here where you can duplicate the page, have the properties of the page or add the sub page. Anytime you're adding something, you can use this little plus key that's down here. And this graphic over here just shows you what your menu or how your pages lay out. All right, from there, the next tab in, or the first tab in this situation is where you're going to add your content. And you have two, um, the two sidebars that I have going on here. The first one shows you basic um, information. You can add a text box, add an image, embed something, whether it's a YouTube video, you can pull something directly from your drive. You then have a series of prefab layouts that you can put those items in. Or if you scroll a little bit further down, you get to this area down here and you have a variety of things. You can do collapsible text. You can have a table of contents so that you can jump to different places in it. You can have an image gallery where you have different pictures that scroll through. Create a divider, you can add your calendar, any of the different variety of Google products. So your possibilities and even the, the students' possibilities for what they can build are completely endless because even if you don't use a prefab layout, you have that opportunity to place and resize things where they make sense to you. One of the things though that you do want to make sure that your students are aware of is that when they are using files from their drive, they need to be shared so that it's either publicly viewable or it's viewable to whoever you're sharing those um, sites with. Okay, so the third thing that we want to highlight is the different design elements that exist. If you look over here on the left here, you have your title page. From there, you have the option to change an image. You can upload images from Drive. You can upload images from the internet. You can basically change this background into anything that, into pretty much anything that you can find. And that's certainly an opportunity where you can teach the kids about images that are you know, licensed and copyrighted versus images that are free to everybody. But that's a completely different um, Google moment in time. The other thing that you can do, you can also change the heading type. This is the standard heading type. You can make your heading type more narrow and you can certainly make it take up the entire page as well. Over on your sidebar insights, you're gonna see this third tab of themes and that's where you're going to have stock color schemes as well as fonts and things that you can work with. But as I said, a lot of those things are customizable along the way. Okay, one of the things that you should do as you get to the end of getting the page built or getting the page built to a point where you can start to view it, you get to the end of that first chapter, you're going to wanna make sure that you publish that page. 
And when you press the publish key, which is up in the top here, you will have this publish site box come up. You have a basic address and then you're going to add to it. You can have the kids add to it, um, you know, whatever your class name is and their last name or any of a variety of things, obviously reminding them to keep it professional. Um, the other thing that you can do and they can do is they can manage who sees it. When you first go to publish a site within our system, anyone in Woodbridge Township can see the site once you publish it. You do have the opportunity to work with your published settings, that, which I made some graphics of over on the side here. All right, so in the published settings, you can make a completely public version of it, which would be this first tab up in the top here. You can certainly, anyone who in Woodbridge Township can find, or only specific people. If you wanted it published so that you were the only one could, that could see it while it was being built, then you would certainly use that tab. When, when you go to change these published settings, the share with others will come up as well, and that will give you places where you can add specific collab collaborators, add specific people who can see it, and things of that nature. All right, so this particular, this is the site that um, is an example site that was put together by one of my kids. This is one of the nicer ones that I've seen over time. And in this, again, as I said, she's got her title page here. She, she um, switched out this graphic here. She left her name, she created a taskbar. And then with each chapter, because she didn't use the idea of subpages, all of her chapter headings come out across this memo on the, or this menu on the top. And then from there, you can see she's got a graphic, she's got a description, she's got a title. And this is all work from the time that she spent in my class. So she was one of the few, she actually cataloged every assignment that we did. Whereas usually with this assignment, what I would often have the kids do is to um, highlight a couple of assignments just to get them familiar with the process. All right, let me jump back into the presentation here because I have one or two other things we're going to look at. All right. Okay. Now, when you're dealing with this in Google Classroom, the way that I often set it up, I set it up as um, two assignments, the final portfolio submission, which is where your published link is going to go. And then for each checkpoint or at the each, end of each chapter or each section, I create an assignment so that they know when the checkpoint is due. And what you're going to want to do is copy the link for the final submission and actually put that in your assignment, you add that to the assignment. Let me, here, let me back out a second and show you what I mean. Okay. All right, just give me one second here. I think I just knocked myself out, which I did. All right. All right, let me pull this back up for us. Okay, so if you look at this, if you're in classroom, if you're in classroom and you go to the assignment itself, okay, we have the chapter two assignment. And in the chapter two assignment, when you look at the instructions, you have um, this is a copy of the site that I can push out to the kids that they can then make a copy of to get them started. But this link over here, this links you back to the assignment where the work actually needs to be put or where the work is going to be housed. So that way, the original assignment or the checkpoint assignment, all they do is mark that as done so that you know that it's done when you use your to-do list or something like that. And you can submit a grade there for them and you can submit feedback there, but it's not going to affect their actual submission and it's not going to change the ownership of their submission. So it's one of the things with Google Classroom, anytime the kids turn something in, turn, a, turn an assignment in, the ownership of that item changes to the teacher until the teacher returns it or until the teacher um, or until the child unsubmits it. 
So with the portfolio submission itself, you want to make sure that that's something that they're building and they're publishing and they're reviewing it, but you don't want them to turn that in until the very last checkpoint, which I know can occasionally be a little confusing, but that's why I suggest that you copy the link to the submission assignment each time you set up a checkpoint. Okay. Come back here a second. All right, so now let me unshare this moment and see if there's any questions. Okay or if anybody has any questions. I know that was a lot of information. Okay, you see the student sites, when you publish the link, you get a published link and they actually, um, they can add that link to the final submission to the final submission assignment, and you can see it through there. Um, hopefully that, Michaela, that answered your question. It, yes, Kathy, it does look a bit like PowerPoint or slides, but it's a living document that you can continually revise and publish. And honestly, if you change the settings on the site, you can take that website with you. So in other words, that's something that the kids could use in say even college admissions where they wanna see what your virtual prowess is. They wanna see what you're capable of doing. The biggest thing with slides is slides is a single file that you're taking with you. So yes, you can take it with you, but if, you know, when the kids, if they don't take it with them when it's time to leave the Woods Township bubble, you're eventually going to lose access to that link. So you would either need to make a copy of it to a public Google domain so that you could take it with you or um, you will lose it. So the transitional difference with um, sites is that once you publish that site, you have the opportunity to make that site public to everybody. So any other questions? All right. Um, my contact information was in the PowerPoint, or not the PowerPoint, yes, in the slides. So if anybody has any additional questions moving forward, absolutely reach out and I would love to try to help you work through them and solve them. So the only other thing I'm gonna do, I know, I think Joe left the link to the surveys. I do have a second link to the surveys that I can also throw in there if need be. And there's actually also, um, there's also a link to the surveys at the end of my presentation. So, and I think that takes me just about to 240. So, Joe, who am I transferring? Uh, to, um, am I muted now? To, um, um, Erica Campbell. Okay. Thank you for your for everybody's seamless transition. Don't forget, Erica, just check out the waiting room in case you got people that are popping in just to see you. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna put the link to the survey in again. I'll try and keep repopulating that after each turn. Uh, oop, I just sent that to just I just sent that to just Cheryl Giordano. Sorry about that. Let me uh <laughs> let me send that to everybody. Um and again, that's very it's very important that you fill out the uh, the surveys for our presenters, okay? Awesome. Wendy, great job, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Thank for that. you. All right, Erica, you should have all the access you need now. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, okay. Hi, everybody. I am Erica. I like Wendy. Sorry, I don't know why that remuted. Um, I just sent you the link to my form. Um, I'm going to be doing something similar to Brian, but I'm going to I'm going to still word it the way I want to. But if you guys have any questions, feel free to interrupt me, and maybe that I can answer some questions that Brian didn't have time to get to. So I will be sharing with you. Okay. 
All right. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, can everybody see it? Can somebody tell me if they see it? I did this right. I see it, Erica. You're good. Thanks. Okay. So today I'm just going to go over a little bit about Google Forms, quiz, and grading. I'm sure most of you already know how to do this, um, but I'm going to go through it again. I'm also going to talk about some troubleshooting that I have discovered with my students, um, as well as my other science teacher uh, via this distance learning format that we're in. So my name is Erica Campbell. I am a science teacher. I teach at Avenel Middle. I have been teaching science for seven years. Like Wendy had said previously, I have just, I re-got my Google One and level one and two certifications this year. I had let them lapse. I am working right now to be a Google trainer. I am also an Apple teacher. I am happily married to a firefighter and I am a mom to a beautiful little three-year-old who is very spunky. Um, I also have dogs and I'm a big dog advocate. Okay, so the benefits to using a form to make a quiz. They're great for formative assessment. It grades it for you. Com, and when the quizzes come up, you click blank quiz at the top of the screen. If you happen to just click new, you can go back and change it to a quiz and it works the same exact way. I will get into that. When you get started, you start it like you would normally start a quiz. You add your questions, you use the plus sign to answer, add your question and you put your question there and your answers here. I'm going to show you a quiz that I made up for this. Um, this is just a very simple quiz that I had made up on mitosis. So as you can see, I just added three questions to this. How I, when I click on it, I add the question there and I add my choices there. I'm going to go back in a minute and show you how to make that a quiz. Though. So. Once you get started, the first and foremost, you want to go to the settings at the top of the page. So you can find the settings icon up here. Once you get to that settings icon, it brings you up to this. So there's different ways you can do this here. Um, you can click to collect email addresses or not. I always click it. it you'll still get your quiz results. However, I always click that in case the kids forget to put their name in there or they're acting silly and they put a different name, you know it's from them. Um, and for me, I always make sure that it's restricted. So only Woodbridge Township districts um, IDs can be used. The benefit of this is so they can't go and take it on their personal device. I always limit it to one response. And then this is something that I noticed that you can do. And it's only, and I've only ever came into a problem with it in the classroom. Well, you, depending on how you run your classroom, you can have the kids edit after they submit it. However, something I learned teaching on block scheduling, if my block three, I have lunch right in the middle of my block. So if my kids are taking a quiz and they leave and I don't, enable it to edit after submit. When they come back after lunch, everything they have done, if the computer shut down, will be lost. So if you are doing this in the classroom and you do have a class that gets broken up, that is a really important button and I've learned that the hard way. So how to make anything a quiz, whether you use the quiz form or not, is this little toggle right here. You wanna make sure it's on. So it's make a quiz. And then you further have the option of immediately giving them their results after each submission or later after manual review. I usually click later after manual review because I like to personally go in and check different students, um, excuse me, different students' answers based upon IEPs, maybe I'm
Eric, I don't know if you can hear me. Sorry to interrupt, but your sound keeps going in and out. Students are doing it, so it's a locked mode on Chromebook. That's great because once they start that quiz, it pops. They can't open up any other tab and they can't do anything until they submit the quiz. However, if you select this mode, locked mode on Chromebooks, right now when we're on distance learning, if a student is at home and say they're taking the quiz on their MacBook because they don't have a Chromebook, they won't even be able to answer the quiz. So while that's a really good feature, it's not a great one for distance learning. When you are done, just like with everything, click on save, okay? Now, to go back and actually add an answer is simple. Now that you've enabled it to be a quiz, when you go to your questions, you will see answer key. I always turn my questions on to make them required so they can't be skipped. But then all I do is click on answer key and I select my right answer and then I assign any point value that I want. And when I'm done, I simply click done. This is where it gets a little bit repetitive because you are going to have to do that for every single question. But again, the time it takes to do that compared to the time it takes if you didn't have that done and you were going in and grading it manually, it's, it's just a time saver. And especially if you're like me and you have kids at home, you kind of need to save that time, especially now during distance learning. So this is another quiz I have. So you could see that the students have already responded to this one. So I have questions and then I have the responses. I can now view it several different ways. I can click on the summary to see the overall average, excuse me, of the overall assignment. I can click and see it based upon the question or I can click individual and see it based upon the individual student. And lastly, and this is my most important and my favorite things, I love to always save and have a hard copy of my grades. So right here at the top on the responses, you have the ability to click and you will download it to Sheets. So when you download it to Sheets, it looks like this. So everything that you will have on your quiz will generate. And I always keep a copy of this and I save it in a different folder in my Google Drive. And I just title it the name of that quiz. That way I can always go back and reference it. Now, I know I still have about 10 minutes, but I wanted to take this time. I have recorded it over, so if you miss this or you want to share it with somebody, go for it and the link to my form. But does anybody have any questions for me as far as grading this? Hold on, let me turn this share off. Oh, stop sharing. Sorry. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so I just saw that you couldn't hear me. My internet probably went out because I have a bunch of you frozen. There's been a few issues with your sound, Erica, just so you're aware. You did cut out once or twice, but you're okay. Okay, I could go back. Honestly, I don't know what it is. Ever since we had those storms two nights ago, my internet on everything in my house has been kicking me out nonstop. So, all right, so I'm good now. So, she just went out again. No, are you still there? I hear your keyboard. Yeah, Erica, we can hear you. <laughs> I'm typing. back. I was just typing back to Brittany and that I am on my district home, but I've been watching since Brian started and my computer didn't go out once. Hmm. So I don't know. 
I have everything else closed out. Let me just close out a few more tabs and I cleared everything else out. So I don't know why it's still freezing, but I will just go back over it and I will just say that there are many other features that obviously can be used as far as using the forms. If, has anybody on here used forms so far and used it yes. to make a quiz? Yes. All right, do you find it, um, Barbara, I see you raised your hand. Do you find it easier um, for you as grading when you do it that way? And I also have another question. How does your class prefer it? Do you set it up so they get their feedback right away or do you like to do it so you can manually reveal it? I always do it so that the, um, it's later on so that once everybody's handed in the test, we can go over it together. It's just easier. I'm a history teacher over at Colonia. Um, it's easier to grade. I also add a column in there. So because with, with Google Forms, you can only do whole numbers. You can't do like 2.5 if you had a 40 question test. So you've got to add a column in there. That's like column C plus two equals some parentheses C plus two. Um, times say 2.5 because it's a four and then close the parentheses and that'll give you another column with the correct um grade in it yes and that is something i have noticed as well oh, you're gone again but it's easy i'll talk over her while she's doing that it's easier <laughs> if you just use one point each that's not funny shetty Barbara, the only other way to get around that is you guys have to complain to google forms constantly to add uh, no, partial points. I'm actually fine with using one point each time because then I know how many questions I'm putting into the um, form itself. It's that's just me. Yeah, and see, and I like that strategy, and that's a good strategy to use as well. Jill, I noticed that you had had a comment about the lock mode. Yeah, for distance learning, don't use lock mode. Yeah. Because if the student is not on a district managed Chromebook, they're not going to be able to access it. But again, when you're in the classroom, it is a great tool to use. But you also have to keep in mind that if you are creating a locked mode and say it's a quiz that you are going to allow your students to take home and finish, or if you're going to let a student that was absent make it up at home, you do have to go back to settings, how we set, how I showed you to set up the form, and you have to turn that off. Otherwise, they will not be able to answer it at home. So while locked mode is an amazing feature and it's great, especially so you know the students can't click off to other tabs throughout the quiz, Unless you are in the classroom and you are all on those district managed devices, it's not really a great tool to use. Thank you. So, but again, and I want to apologize to everybody again for my internet issues. I have been troubleshooting all day. I was on a Zoom this morning. I was on the Zooms from when Brian started and I had nothing. And of course, when I go, it cuts out. So, hi, embarrassed, but you live, you learn. These are, this is the learning curve of technology. Very good point, Erica. It is, and we deal, we've dealt with this all the time, so. And, and that's the thing with technology and what's really important in the classroom as well. You kind of have to glow with the flow. And if you make the, if you make an assignment and you locked it and now you got to let the student go home to make it up, you're going to have to go back in and you're going to have to edit it. And that's like what, Google is very easy in allowing you to make these edits as you go to make it very compatible for what you need to accomplish in your classroom, which is one of the reasons that I think Google is such a phenomenal tool to use because there's a lot of other stuff out there and it's not as user friendly and Google is really just great for if you've never used technology or if you're a technology pro it really bridges the gap between all levels of technology usage in the classroom i've been using technology since i started in the classroom again i said i teach science so i'm very big on a blended classroom so again google and this google forms is just a great tool and it's an easy way and you can organize all your data and you could go back to it for years to come and you don't have to put everything in a filing cabinet with 3,000 copies. Oh, I like both. Oh, I still have papers too. Don't get 
me wrong. I, I, I have a binder of all hard copy stuff. Don't get me wrong. I don't hate paper. <laughs> All right. Um, does um, anybody else have any questions? Again, I apologize for being the fool in that technology fail over here. Joe? Yeah, I'm here. I thought you were going to say something. I was just yes, so ready, to, I. ready to, uh, to transition to the next person. That's all. Um, all right. Who's next? Al, right? Al is next. Al, if you're listening, I hope you're ready. May the technology gods be ever in your favor. Hold on, let me switch. Don't, as as uh, Eric is switching, don't forget to fill out the survey for everybody today. That would be great. We'll also, um, I'll ask that the, the uh, trainees today um, give their, um, the trainers, excuse me, give their um, slide decks. Al's the host. Yes, give their slide decks to us so we can put these on the Google site. Uh, just in case anybody wants to take a bigger, uh, deeper dive into them and really look at them. But great job on that, by the way, Erica. Sorry. Uh, no, like no, please, don't be sorry. It happens all the time. Look, at least it's not porn. I got that on you. So don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm that guy. Okay, so uh wasn't mine, though. It was somebody else. We got, I was the official Zoom bomber. Um, okay, so uh, Al, you're up, buddy. It's all yours. All right. Hi everyone, um, my name is Al. I'm a math teacher. I've been teaching at Avenel Middle for two years. I have a wonderful wife and a dog who can spend all day at Sea Warren Dog Park. Now, what I need you to do is um, I posted a link in the chat. You are going to click that, and then from there, it should also lead you to making a copy of my sheets for today. So oh, let me, just in case, I'll post the other one as well. Just Al, it's uh, requesting permissions. Uh, of course. Okay, so let's see. Mine's buffering. Um, okay. Don't feel bad about buffering. My whole life just buffered. It's okay. For some reason, it just signed me out of my own uh, Gmail, even though it's never done that. But okay, that's fine. All right, so let's see. Okay, maybe I'll just send the direct link to the um, the sheets and go from there. I just found it. Now you can put this view only, and then people would just have to make a copy to follow along with you. Do it that way too. Okay. Um. You know, let me just try this, just to you know say I did. Absolutely, no problem. And then, um, you know, if that doesn't work. Technology definitely has that learning curve like Erica was talking about. All right, guys, please let me know if that second link worked. I would appreciate that. That link works out. Is a video? Um, okay, it's the video. Okay, so that video is basically a summary of what I'm going to do today in case anyone uh, misses any part. Um, okay, so this is the, this should be the Excel sheet. Okay. All right. So I came over prepared and have too many bit.ly links. So I don't know why it's giving you that one. All right. So let's see. All right. That most recent link should be the actual Excel document. The video? No, it should not be a video. Okay. Oh, the same. All right. Yeah. Let me just... It's the same string. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send the whole 
I'm just gonna copy and paste the spreadsheet link. And from there, just make a copy as Joe Vitale mentioned. And then we'll go about it that way. No problem, Al, thank you for that. Sorry about the mix up. Um, All right, I, no worries. I, yeah, I was trying to get you to be able to follow along with him. Uh, yeah, th this one's gonna be much more interactive where we're gonna go step by step in creating the um, sheet together. Um, it says conditional formatting on the flyer that was sent out, but I actually changed it to make it a little bit more applicable for everybody. And that way we can use more traditional functions of the spreadsheet. If anyone has any issues, please let me know. And I would appreciate that. Thank you. Jesus okay, so I'm going to be starting in roughly a minute, um, but I will give a brief overview while everyone's trying to get settled on that. Um, I use Google Sheets for a, a lot of different functions, whether it be Flippity for games. Um, I use it for my own personal budget sheets. Um, in the future, I will be using it so students can kind of create their own personal gradebook so that they can kind of keep track of how they're doing and looking back. And when they had a, an IXL project, they were able to keep track and enter their own grades throughout an entire marking period. Um, but today, we're gonna focus on the budget sheet part. Now, it's gonna look very basic, and you'll be able to add your own rows and columns as you see fit. So this is more so of a template of what it might look like. Um, so, when you go to the budget sheet, we're just going to go step by step. So, your first, oh, I have to share my screen. Give me one second. Okay. All right, guys. So, this is my budget sheet. Now, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to create your own budget sheet just based off a simple Excel sheet. Okay, I'll zoom in a little bit. So, and no matter what you're doing, you can use any of these functions on any Excel sheet that you use. So what you could do first is you could highlight all the categories on the far left. And these can be your own categories. For me, um, I think these are very representative of what I would do for work. You could go to data on the top, on the top and then sort by column A to Z. That way it alphabetizes all of your information. And if you are coming up with categories on the fly to create this budget, you don't have to worry about putting it in order already. You can just sort it at the end. Sorry, that was my alarm saying I have to sign out. Uh, I'll, I'll just do that later. All right, so your first step involving numbers. I would put the expected costs. I'm going to use arbitrary numbers. So if you look in column H, this will be my expected cost column. And I'm just going to make up numbers that I might spend in a given six-month period for school. And I'll do... 25. Okay. So feel free to just enter your own arbitrary numbers, or if you're going to use this, feel free to, you know, put in the realistic numbers that you'd like. All right, so now one of my 
favorite functions of sheets is being able to just add up a whole bunch of numbers. So I don't have to worry about the calculator work, making an error, things like that. So I'm gonna first calculate the total of items in January. So imagine I spent one, two, three, four, and five, right? Now it's easy enough to figure those numbers out, but what you could do is you could press equals, sum, all in capital letters, parentheses, and then from here, your values for the first number and the last number separated by a colon. So if you look at my cell B2, B2 is second column, second row. I can put B2 as my starting and B6, which is the last cell I want to add as my last. So B2 colon B6 parentheses enter. And it will give me the sum of all five of those boxes combined. All right, I'll give a second. And if anyone wants to ask any questions on how I got there, feel free to let me know. All right, so our next step will be to click and drag. So you don't have to keep entering this formula over and over again. So you're going to click the January total, which should be the box that says 15 in it, at least for me. And if you look on the bottom right of the, of the cell, they'll have a blue rectangle. You can click that and drag it through all of the months, all of the expected costs, and eventually the end, the actual cost, okay? Now we didn't set up the actual costs yet because that requires a different um, set of sum cells, S-U-M. And all of these zeros appear because you have no numbers yet, but I'll just fill it in to prove my point that it will work. I'll just fill in random months and with random numbers. Okay, so your next step will be to create the sums, but now for each individual category over that six month period. So first we did each month's total, and now we're gonna do each category's total. So in your actual cost box, you can click that and put equals sum, left parentheses, now, my first is still B2, because it's the first uh, box for celebrations in January, a colon, and now my last month is June, which is located in G2. So B2, colon G2, and enter. Now, it took January's $1 and, April, and April's $7, make eight dollars now as you can imagine these are very easy numbers but when you have six months worth of purchases and you have five different categories that would be a lot of numbers to add up and figure out this makes it a lot more convenient 
And now I'm also going to click and drag those so I don't have to enter it another four times. So I click and drag through the sum uh, through that option again, and it will now add up for each individual category throughout the six months. All right, nothing in the chat. So now to make sure that our, you know, our budget actually stays under budget, I can do equals and just click the cells that you need to subtract from each other. So I need to do expected cost, click H2, minus clicking actual cost of I2, and press enter. So it'll automatically subtract for me. And as I can see, I've only spent $42. I sell $42 left to send for, and for celebrations. So I'm not over budget yet, which is awesome for those people who like money. And, and I'm going to click and drag that as well. So you're going to click that bottom right corner, drag it throughout, and it'll do it all six times for you. So you don't have to worry about that. So I still have $272 left in my total budget. So at this point, your budget sheet is actually mostly set up. At this point, what you could do is if you have multiple purchases in a month, I could click any of my cells, depending on where it is. I'm going to put mine in June celebrations because as we know, when summer vacation is rolling around, we like to buy gifts, we like to buy for parties and things of that nature. So I'm going to make a $15 purchase. So equals 15. And I'm going to include a $7 purchase. So I have to make sure it says equals 15 plus 7. And as you can see, it changed my June celebrations tap box cell, my June total cell, my actual cost for celebrations, and all of the various budgets. So by setting up your budget sheet, it actually changes five boxes at once, depending on how many different formulas you have going. All right, and now my, oh, here are some of Thank you, Jamie. I love Sheets too. I feel like Sheets doesn't get enough credit or what it really is, but considering I use it in my everyday life, and it actually does keep me on track to not spending as much money, it literally has saved me a fortune. Now, um, I'm going to show something a little bit more advanced. So if you highlight the differences column, and you right click the differences column, and you can actually scroll down to something that says conditional formatting. So I'm going to click that, and it can actually make different, different cells, different colors, depending on what number is in that box. So I want to make sure I'm under budget, and I associate green with that number being good. So greater than or equal to zero could make those boxes green. Thank you, Brian. I didn't realize it was used that much, but I'm glad to know you use it quite often behind your email. So now I'm going to go back into that conditional formatting. I'm going to show you how to get there one more time. You're going to highlight the cells that you want to apply that to, or just click on the row, or the column, rather. You're going to right-click and scroll down to conditional formatting. Okay. 
now I'm going to add another rule. Now, if I am going over budget, that's not the best thing in the world. So I am going to say if my cells are less than zero, I'm going to make my cells red because I don't want that. But just to make sure it worked, let's say I spent $500 in May supplies. Not only did my student supplies list go into the red, my entire budget went into the red because I spent more than I wanted to for the whole six month period. So that's about it of what I have to say about my basic budget sheet. Um, when, for, at least for a budget sheet, my personal one, I like to put the various bills I have to pay on the side. And then on the bottom, I might say like, try to save this much money there. Um, and again, it, just because this is a budget sheet, you, you know, you can still pull out the sum function. You can pull out the difference function, dragging. You can use all these functions in other Excel sheets. Um, so that, that's all I really have to say. And I do really appreciate your time, everybody. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Al, <clears throat> for showing us that with sheets. And then our, our last presenter, I believe, is uh, Becca. Yes. All right. Becca, who probably locked herself in a solitary room so her dogs don't jump off. <laughs> no, they're they're sleeping. Don't jinx me. <laughs> I that all, I, we both have two golden retrievers, so we we know that all too well. So, <laughs> Rebecca, I get it. I had to lock my dogs out of the room. <laughs> yeah, they're sleeping, thankfully. So far, they might pop up later. You never know. Right. I'm just I, mine are sleeping until the UPS man drives by. <laughs> me too. I closed all my blinds on purpose. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, hey, everyone. Threw, sure, I just threw in another link to the surveys. If you haven't filled out surveys of anyone who's went so far, please do so. Uh, Rebecca, take it away. Awesome. So Joe put in the link for the surveys um, at the end. I know a lot of you have been on for a lot of the trainings. We created surveys that you can go through and fill out. Um, we ask that you be as honest as possible. I know I've been honest on surveys, um, but it definitely helps us to become better Google educators and Google trainers. Um, so my presentation today is going to go over how to add voiceovers on Google Slides. So a little bit about me is that I teach um, first grade in Matthew Jago School. So I use Google Slides with my kids every morning. Um, I create a morning meeting slide for my kids and I started adding voiceovers so that way my students were able to go back and listen to the directions um, that I had already said, so they're able to just kind of go in, listen to them as many times as they need. So it's really a helpful tool um, in graduate school. I also use it a lot too when I'm doing presentations. So not only my first grade students, but my colleagues are using them as well. So for today, I created just a little slide deck that you can go through. I'm going to walk you through how to create a presentation and how to add the voiceovers so that way you're able to do it on your own. So I'm going to share my screen. Give me your head. Okay. Okay. So for today, um, we'll talk about the Google Slides. So the first thing that I wanted to go over is just how to log into your Google account um, because we don't always use them at the elementary level. So creating a Google slide is equivalent to using PowerPoint in Microsoft Word. Um, what's great about a Google slide is that you can have multiple people working on it at the same time. So to log into your Google account, it's your first name, dot your last name at Woodbridge Township School District, nj.com. Um, in the top right corner of your Google account, you will see these nine little dots. Um, it's actually called a waffle. It'll say Google Apps. So you will go up here and you're going to click on it and then you're going to look for the slides icon, which is right here. It's the yellow tab and it says slides underneath it. So you're gonna click on that 
it will take you to a new page. This is the slides homepage. Um, to start a new presentation, you can click on blank slides and Google has tons of templates, which are great to use if you're just trying to get something done quick or you can always download templates or create your own. So you're going to click on the plus sign, which is the blank. From here, you'll open up a blank presentation. There's all different themes that you can add. It's whatever you are working for. I know with my students, I try to keep them fun and creative. Um, for today, I have already created a Google slide account. So you can see that, move it down, that my slides is right here. So once you've logged in and you opened your presentation, you're going to add an extension onto your Google account, which will allow you to self-record and voice record. Um, so from here, you need to go back to your Google homepage and you're gonna go back to that waffle, which are the nine dots up on top. Google comes with tons of extensions already on there, which is the Drive, your Gmail, Classroom, all of the things that we're very familiar with. But in order to add something new, Google has a bunch of its own apps. So you would scroll down to the bottom and you'll see a button that says more from G Suite Marketplace. So if you have an iPhone or if you use an iPad because you're at the elementary level, it, the G Suite Marketplace is the same as the App Store. You will click on this. And it's gonna open you up to a new page, which is G Suite Marketplace. Here you can search for tons of different apps, but because today we're going to work on adding audio to our slides, we're going to type in the search box, um, the slide that is going to be called Cloud Audio Recorder. So this is the app that I use to record myself when I import it into the slides. So from your G Suite Marketplace, you could type in Cloud Audio Recorder. And you'll see it'll pop up. It looks just like this. Um, it's a black background. It says audio recorder. There's a microphone. You can see sound bars on the screen. Um, a few other ones might pop up as there's tons of different recorder extensions that you can add on. This one's really reliable. I use it all the time and it saves your recording right to your Google Drive so you don't have to go ahead and do anything else. Um, from here, because it's already installed on my Google extension, it's going to look a little bit different, but you're going to see a button that says install. Down here, you can see the drive symbol and the plus. So you would just click on this and it will take you to the cloud audio record. Um, the icon for it is the yellowish orange background with the microphone in it. Mine says uninstall because like I said, it's already installed. So you would click on the install button and then it's gonna prompt you to go through various um, questions allowing you to go through and give access to your um, school Gmail account because we need to approve it and let the access through, you can hit approve. Um, it'll link right to your school account if you have more than one Google account, if you have a personal account and your school account, just make sure that you're doing it through your school account because I've experienced something where I have um, opened it in my other account and that doesn't work because we need to use the school one. So once you've downloaded it, you are able to go back to your presentation, which is in Google Slides. So I'm just bouncing from the tabs up at the top. Um, so once you go back to your presentation, you are able to finish your presentation and go through and put all the text that you want and the pictures that you want. Um, and then the last step that you're gonna do is add your audio. So in order to add your audio, you need to first go to your cloud recorder. So to access the cloud recorder, you would go to your waffle button, which are those nine dots, and you're gonna click on that. You're going to look for the extension that you just added. So right here, you'll see the cloud audio recorder. So you're going to click on that. From, the from that button, it'll take you to the cloud audio recorder homepage. Um, this is very basic, it's very user-friendly, which is why I use cloud audio recorder. Um, it's 
a matter of four clicks and then it's saved to your Google Drive. So the first thing that you would do is click start. Um, so I'll just do a practice one with you. You're gonna start, you can see that it's gonna record you, um, how long that you've been talking, your volume. If you're using your phone or your laptop or your Chromebook or your iPad, um, there's already a built-in microphone so you don't have to worry about adding anything else. Um, I use my laptop because the microphone on there is great and the kids are able to hear the audio. Whenever you're done recording yourself and getting out what you need to say, you're able to hit the stop button. So you'll see that you stopped it and then you have two choices. You have the choice to export as an MP3, which is real time or export as a wave. You're always going to export as an MP3. So you are gonna click on that choice. MP3 is the way that the file is saved, so that way you're able to import it into your slides presentation. From here, you all have three options. So it says play recorded audio. So if you wanted to listen to it before saving it, which I suggest that you do, um, you would just click this button and you would be able to go through and listen to what you've recorded. And then you have save to computer and save to Google Drive. So we're gonna click save to Google Drive and you will see this pop-up screen. So right now your audio recording is saved as my audio recording and then the date. Um, we want to re-save it as the name that you're going to be looking for when you insert it. So for example, I always insert it onto my morning meeting slides. So I name my file morning meeting and then I put the date so that way I know where it is. In order to save it properly, you need to click change after you renamed. So change, and you'll see that the file name has been changed up here. And then you're able to click save to Google Drive. Down at the bottom in green, it'll say up, uploaded to drive. So that way you know that your audio sound will be on your drive. If you want to check to make sure that it's on your drive, you're able to go back to your Google page, click on that waffle button one more time, and you can go right to your drive, which is the triangle, the green, yellow, and blue. You can click on that. and you will see that your audio recording will pop up. It's always going to appear as a red square with a headphones in it. So you'll see that the new name is here, morning meeting, and that way your audio file is uploaded right into your Google Drive. So to go back to our presentation, this just goes over how you get to your Google Drive. We're going to insert our audio into our presentation. So in order to do this, you're going to use the menu up at the top. You're first going to go to insert. And then you are going to go to audio. And there will be all the different audio files that you have recorded so far. You can see that I have a bunch in my Google Drive because I've been using it for a while. And because you named it, you're able to see which file you wanna put into your presentation. So I'm gonna click on the morning meeting and it will pop up right away. When it pops up, it will appear as a gray circle with a volume button in it. To the right is a screenshot of what the insert audio file looks like. Um, so that way you'll always be able to go back and look at it. Once you import your audio into your slide, you will have a bunch of different format options. So I want to show you, so it's going to be insert audio, click on it. So it usually puts it down in the corner. Also, you can make this as big or as small as you want. I tend to make them a little bit bigger for my students. That way they're able to click on it and they're able to see it. Once you click on your gray circle, you'll see that a format options pops up. So format 
format options is just the way for us to figure out how we want our audio to play. So you'll have a few different ways um, to get your audio to play. So the first option is on click. So when your student or whoever is viewing your presentation comes to the slide with the audio, they will be able to hover over the audio and then the bar will pop up and they will have the option to play it. They can see how long it is as well as where um, it is in the audio. Then you can, or you can choose the option called automatically. This is used when you want your student to click on the slide and right away the audio starts playing. Um, they cannot control when to start it and stop it. It'll just keep going. And then finally, there's one more option, which is called loop audio. Loop audio is used usually for background music. Um, if you're creating a video or if you have a bunch of pictures on your slide presentation that you want the music to keep playing, you play loop audio. So as soon as it's done, it's just going to restart and it's going to loop all the way through. This is the three different um, types of audio that you can put in. So the autoplay is the automatic. The click is where you click the play button and the loop is when it continuously plays. Finally, I just wanted to show you an example of what I give my first grade students in the morning. Um, so every morning they have a different good morning slide and then I just write a little bit about our day. And then I inserted the audio right here. So they're able to go and this one is a click so that when they hover over it, they're able to click the play button. You can see it's a minute and four seconds and it just goes over the directions that I have set for the day and what they're going to be using. Um, voice Voiceovers are really great, especially during distance learning, just because our students are able to hear the directions multiple times um, if we're not one-to-one -one with them or on Zoom or on Google Meet. Um, so this is something that I use all the time. I know it can be used in the high school level as well. Um, so I'm going to post my slide up so that way you can go through and you can watch the video. There's, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I put my um, I put my email up there. It's really easy and very user friendly for the kids as well as you. Um, the biggest thing is to just make sure that you have your audio right in your Google Drive so that way you can import it into your slides. Becca, we had one question about whether or not you can use this video feature in forms. I'm not sure if you know. In forms to yeah. add your audio. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but you, yeah. if you can do it, you would still be able to use the extension. Um, I'm, I have played with forms and I know that there's a way to like add images and other stuff like that. So that's something I would have to go play with. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, same. I'm not sure either. <clears throat> yeah, you might be able to add things. If you save it to your drive, you might be able to add it. Yeah. Yeah, I know there's a lot of stuff that you can add, but um, what I like about Cloud Audio Recorder is that it saves right to your drive. So you're not uploading it. Um, it's automatically there. So yeah, you're somebody, kind of skipping a step. Somebody, uh, Shannon Connolly made, uh, this is great for students who need directions more than once. Like, yes. <laughs> you know, repeat ourselves 16 yeah. times a day. Um, I'm going to put my directions on loop. <laughs> even, in an on <laughs> even in an online distance setting. Um, okay, so um, Jamie, Al was having a little bit of trouble. It was, it was giving his survey a pre-filled link um, and not allowing a, a submit. So I just wanted to, to take a moment to look into that. If you could, uh, I'm going to throw in a link to the surveys one more time. Al has a separate survey link that I'll add again, just all the way yeah. at the bottom. Um, I don't know, something funky happened, but I, I think we were able to fix it. So if you were on mine and um, you haven't done the survey yet, please do so. It's weird, uh, but you know, yeah. technology we've, happens. That's so. happened to us where like Joe, I know for a fact that we've given out surveys to people and it does that. And we've never quite figured out why. Okay, I am getting responses now, if that helps. Yes. Yeah, and I posted that link again. So that link that, that, that's at the bottom, that's Al. And then um, Joe will post the full link, uh, um, the rest of the slides. Yeah, we'll get, um, yeah, we'll do I that. I mean, the rest of the surveys. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that in just, I'm going to do that long. right now. I'm going to give you that. Actually. I have it right here. I mean, I, yeah, okay. I got the bit.ly. Copy link. Uh, so tomorrow we're starting at 11:40. Uh, we've had some oops, we've had some uh, minor issues with time scheduling. Uh, unfortunately, a, a coworker 
uh, had a death in the family and he had to travel out of state. So we're changing some of the, we're not changing the times for tomorrow. We're still starting at 1140. We have an hour's worth of sessions, three 20 minute sessions tomorrow. If you're, if you're willing to come by and look at a couple others, um, you know, I, I hope you at least took one or two things away from today. Um, I really like that. Uh, Rebecca's extension. I thought that was great. Um, I, my, my wife is my CEO. She does all the spreadsheets, so I won't be using Al's, <laughs> but I can use it to, uh, to sort my SGO data. That's for sure. So, um, yes. really an excellent job planning. today by, by all of you. Uh, please, 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 if you have not done so, please take a moment to, to grab that link to the surveys and fill out for the people that you watched today. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, and then as you are, are finished, you're welcome to, to log off and, um, or if anybody has any questions, you want to stick around for a few minutes, you're more than welcome to do that. But if not, we'll, uh, we'll keep this open until about, um, 345 and then, uh, we'll be logging off, but great job by everybody. Really. That was a, that was an excellent showcase. Hey, Joe Vitale. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I, did... I want to, uh, number one, thank you and the tech teacher leaders who have done an outstanding job in sharing their advanced skills. Rebecca, that was awesome. Thank you so much. And I want to, I want to thank all of uh, the teachers who are here to, uh, you to hone your craft and get better and better. You guys are amazing. So proud of you. Thank you.